question about spirituality really is, I mean, you've gone into Judaism here, but you've talked about um, your classical, I guess, prayers to the muse. You used uh, Bhagavant was based on the Bhagavad Gita. So how has spirituality played this part in your writing life and has anything changed now? That's a great question. I mean, yeah, I'm very much a believer, and uh, you probably are too, that there are two levels of reality as, as an artist. And then we're down here on the lower level, and there's a higher level, which I, I think of as the muse or whatever you want to call it, wherever ideas come from. And we writers, you know, we all know, and I know your audience is mostly writers, that ideas don't really come from us, do they? Mm -hmm. They come from some other place. And, and we know how you can get on a roll and you're just sort of automatically typing and then you look back and you go, wow, that's really good, you know? So for me, um, just trying to be a professional writer and get a handle on that dynamic has made me very humble in the, in the face of this higher dimension. I always say a prayer to the muse. The, I did a T.E. Lawrence's prayer from the Odyssey, his translation of the Odyssey. And um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very definitely be a believer in that level of, of spirituality, mm -hmm. that, uh, that we are on a lower plane and there is a higher plane. And actually, in um, well, this gets into resistance a yeah. little bit, but yeah. in, in Jewish mysticism, which I didn't know about this until a couple of years ago, it's kind of the same concept that, that we are on the material plane and the higher plane is called the neshama, the soul. And the neshama is trying to communicate down to us as we are trying to communicate up to it. And there is a force in Jewish mysticism called the yetzer hara that is there to, its purpose is to block you know, like a force of evil to stop us. And uh, I definitely, that's what I call resistance with a capital R. Mm. It's, you know, when writers have a hard time working, that's why. So uh, we can talk further about that, but I'll, I'll stop for the moment. And, uh, yeah. Well, you know, let, let's get a bit more into that because, um, you know, would you, is resistance basically anything that stops us from creating? It's just a, a, a big defining concept, I guess. Can you make that more specific? Uh, well, I always experienced this. This comes from a book of mine called The War of Art, as you know, and, and I talk about a, a, a force called that I call resistance with a capital R. And like right now, as we're talking, I'm sitting, you can't see it, but here's my, here's my keyboard, you know, right here in front of me, which this is. And when I sit down in the morning, I feel like this negative force radiating off that keyboard that's like trying to keep me from doing my work. And to me, I, I consider it's all self-generated. I don't think it comes from out there. But it's that, uh, you know, it's why we buy a treadmill and bring it home and then we never use it, right? <laughs> Anytime we're trying to access a, a higher part of ourselves, I think, um, this shadow element enters the picture, like an equal and opposite force to the force of creation. Like uh, our, I, another al analogy I use is like if, if a tree, we have a tree, and that's our dream, our novel, or whatever creative thing, that tree casts a shadow. And as soon as that tree goes up, the shadow appears. And that shadow is self-sabotage, procrastination, um, stubbornness, uh, you know, um, arrogance, fear, fear of failure, fear of success, all, all of those things that we as writers know. And so to me, a big part of uh, being a writer is learning to deal with that. Mm. And people do, everyone finds their own way to deal with it. To me, I've said this many times, the writing is the easy part. The hard part is sitting down and actually starting to hit the keys. Mm. So I'm a big believer in professionalism and being a pro and uh, in the sense that a pro doesn't allow those negative things to stop her. She sits down and, and does her work. Mm. No, absolutely. I, I, ha I have to show you something now because it's... <laughs> okay. Right, right by my... Uh, so by my desk, I have 
uh, you probably can't read it there, but it's uh, it's a quote. From, oh yeah, I see it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the quote from from the War of Art. On the field of the self stand a knight and a dragon. You are the knight. Resistance is the dragon. The battle must be fought anew every day. And that's I look at that every day, and I, I it's so great to hear you talk about this because that from what you've said, you still get that every day. You you're still fighting that battle after absolutely so many years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never. I don't think it ever goes away for anybody. Um, actors, photographers. I mean, when I wrote The War of Art originally, I thought it's only for writers. Only writers will be interested in this. But, of course, I've gotten letters, you know, by the hundreds from people I never would have thought, you know, uh, people who train animals. So they have resistance, you know. Uh, so <laughs> I, yeah. I think any time we're trying to move from a lower level to a higher level, capital R resistance will kick in and try to keep us on that low level. Mm. And so I guess um, one of the things you say about um, in Turning Pro, uh, more, more, more books, see, <laughs> <laughs> I have it here, um, is, is the difference between an amateur and a pro is in their habits. Are habits the way to beat resistance? And what are some of the habits of a pro? Well, first of all, Joanna, thank you for being so informed and, and Pressfield Deanna here. You know, this is, this is, <laughs> I'm like a PR good. agent. It's good for my ego. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that uh, that the uh, when I was trying to learn to be a writer and was falling on my face over and over and over, the reason I decided finally was that I was an amateur, and I had amateur habits, and I thought like an amateur, and. And what sort of turned the corner for me was just a, a simple sort of turning a switch where I just kind of decided I'm, I'm going to turn pro. I'm going to think like a pro. And uh, one of the things, and this is true, a lot of times I think of athletes are great models for this. One of the things about a, um, a professional athlete is they will, they will play hurt, mm -hmm. right? They, whereas an amateur, you know, you sprain your ankle or something's wrong, you say, ah, well, I won't do it today, you know, but a pro goes every day. And I think that um, a lot of times the model for, for being a pro is just what we do in our jobs, like in our day jobs. Like in our, in, in our day jobs, we show up every day, whether we want to or not, right? We have to get a paycheck, right? Or, and we stay on the job all day, every day. We don't go home. We don't just say, oh, it's 10 o'clock. I'm tired of this. I'm going home, right? So, but yet, when we go into our, our works of passion, our novels or our books or whatever, we suddenly become amateurs and we think, wow, this is really hard. I'm going to, you know, go to the beach, you know, or, you know, somebody, the kids are making noise. And so we go out and play with them, you know, um, and we don't have that kind of hardcore professional attitude. Um, uh, courage plays a lot, takes a lot of guts to do this. Um, patience is also uh, very important, you know, to be patient with ourselves, allow ourselves to, to fall off the wagon sometimes, you know, and to taking the long view is another aspect of it. Not um, imagining we can write our novel in a week and a half uh, that... Uh, Right, and also I, I like to think of it as a lifelong practice. Mm. That it's not just one book; it's not three books. This is uh, this is what we're going to do for the rest of our lives. This is what we do. This is who we are. Mm. And another aspect I think uh, of a professional, and this comes from the Bhagavad Gita that you mentioned, um, is uh, the Bhagavad Gita is. I'm sorry if I'm telling you and your audience things they already know, but um, it's a kind of a mentor-protege story, a Hindu scripture, really, where the the protege is Arjuna, the great warrior, and the teacher is Krishna, who is his charioteer, in other words, God in human form. So God is teaching a mortal man. And one of the things that Krishna says is we're entitled to our labor, but not to the fruits of our labor. And what he meant by that is like, we finish a book, it goes out, it's published, and then we're like glued to the reviews, you know, are we going to get any uh, four-star reviews, anybody going to give us money, right? And what Krishna is saying is, that's not the way the world works. The, the satisfaction needs to come from the work itself, from doing the work itself. So good 
or bad, whatever the response to the, our work is, that doesn't matter. We can't, and uh, Hemingway used to say this too, if you believe the critics when they tell you you're great, then you have to believe them when they tell you you stink, you know? So he said, I don't want to believe anything. So, yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry I'm blathering on. No, no, joy. it's great. And I have that quote down as one of, again, an, another favorite quote, because so often we write a book and everybody's, everyone expects to get this instant success. And, I mean, looking at, um, I guess, The War of Art's a good example, because didn't it become a multi-million bestseller like, years after you actually first put it out and you got on Oprah years later I mean right it was like 10 years and it's not a multi-million by any means but it, it finally it took 10 years for it to finally reach a sort of a critical mass and mm. actually have people hear of it yeah which is which is kind of crazy and, and I know from from your work you had um, incredibly hard times at the beginning of, of your career right you you know you were living in a I car did, I, did, I believe don't all writers have hard times <laughs> <laughs> but weren't you living in your car or something at one point well I was living in a van in a van but I wasn't you know I mean I was couch surfing as they say you know I was visiting friends and that kind of stuff you know? yeah. mooching off friends but I wanted to ask you there about um because the other thing in the turning pro is that a pro doesn't compare themselves to other people and I think well I certainly find this very difficult and I wonder if you had any tips how do we not wake up in the morning hear about someone else's success and compare ourselves <laughs> <laughs> that that's a tough one you know it's like I I agree with you. I hate those stories. You know, you know, so and so wrote a book in three days, and it's now at the top of that. You know, I hate these, hate those stories. But I, I, I think we just have to re sort of. I sort of tell myself, like, I imagine Krishna floating over the air and, sa and saying to me that uh, it's human to be jealous or to you know to compare yourself. But you got to get a handle on that and just stop yourself. You know, you got to be the. Uh, the old analogy that they used to use in the ancient Greece, I'm sure in the English school system, you guys still study this, is the chariot and the, and the charioteer, right? The horses, maybe that's our crazy jealous self, but we have to hang on to the reins and make those horses, you know, stay in their lanes and do what we want them to. Mm, no, fair enough. And another weird thing that I... I ponder as a writer is is this is the balance between ego because we have to have enough ego to want to publish and self-doubt the feeling that we're completely rubbish um, how how do you manage that or you know do you have to manage that well i think those those feelings of self-doubt are resistance capital r resistance and i think they're uh they're they, they're just false it's not true that's not true and uh, you just have to simply, for me, when those feelings arise, I just banish them. You know, I don't allow them. I say, well, that's just, that's resistance. That's, you know, one of the, the theories of resistance is, and I said this on the Oprah show, uh, is that we hear these voices in our head, like self-doubt, and we think those are our thoughts, but they're not our thoughts. There, that's resistance. You know, it's like when you sit down and meditate and you're trying to clear your mind and all this crazy stuff goes through your mind, right? But you, you if you have a teacher, a teacher tells you, just let the thought cross your mind and keep moving, you know? So when I have any self-doubt thoughts, I just, I just banish them. I say, that's resistance. That's not me. And also, I think, Joanna, it's, it's a professional attitude. A professional says... I'm not going to entertain those thoughts for a minute because if I do, I'm going to I'm going to lose. An athlete says the same thing, right? If you're on the starting line of the hundred yard dash or the hundred meter dash, is in your place, um, and you start to think, "Oh, I'm no good compared to these other people," your race is over right then. You're finished. So you just have to clear those thoughts out of your head by an act of will, mm. an act of will to banish them. And and I guess with with the athletic uh, metaphor as well, and thinking about how we cultivate that for for the long term, what what are the ways that you, I guess, de stress and you know clear your mind? Do you have a a practice, a meditation practice, or do you go out play golf? I know you like you're a golfer. I I never de stress, Joanna. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all. I'm
trust 100% of the time. No, no uh, but seriously, <laughs> I really, uh, you know, they say uh, Stephen King writes 365 days a year. And Woody Allen writes 365 days a year. And I'm not that good, but I certainly, I'm not really a believer in vacations and stuff like that. You know, I, I take them, but uh, I, I almost always am very happy to get back to work. So maybe I'm just crazy, but that's the way it works for me. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. All my all my trips are research trips. I'm taking my husband to Barcelona uh, in a couple of weeks, and, and it's all research for books. So. <laughs> ah, <laughs> well, that's good. It's a great way to travel. It so is. That, it is that fun. counts. That's good. Now, I had another question for you. So um, you've obviously, I mean, you've had all kinds of things that people would consider to be successful. Um, but what do you define as success in your career? Um, that's another great question. And um, I just wrote a blog about this. So I don't even know if it's come out yet. But the uh, uh, again, I think you can't look to other to the response of the marketplace as validation for your work because they're going to love stuff that stinks and they're going to hate stuff that's great, mm -hmm. right? So eventually, I think we all have to get to the place where we can be a judge of our own work. And I, I find that for me that I, I can be a judge of my own work. When I look back on something, a book, whatever, I can be pretty objective and I can say, you know, that didn't work. Uh, this part wasn't right. That you know, I could do a lot better. But also, when I when something good comes out, you know, I can say, you know, that that really worked, and I'm proud of that. I'm glad I did it. So I, I but it, this, it's an ongoing self teaching process for me, kind of keeping um, teaching myself to 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 uh, be my own judge of my own stuff, and I think self validation is another quality of uh, a professional. I mean, that's a big word, but what, and it's hard to understand maybe at, at first glance, but what it means is you judge your own stuff and you say to yourself, you know, good work, Joanna. You did a good, you did good today. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care if nobody gets it, you know, you, you did good. And I, and I do feel like uh, the muse is there and she's feeding us stuff, and we're just, I consider myself a servant of the muse, and I'm just trying to be true to her and um, bring her stuff down to earth as best I can mm. as it comes through me. Mm. No, I, I really like that. I think that's that's great. And in that way, we, you know, being true to the things that we want to write about. Um, get, I, I guess the question is about self-censorship. I feel like only recently I've stopped self-censoring my writing because of the judgment, the fear of judgment, basically, which I guess is, is resistance. Do you still suffer from any fear of judgment in what you write? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, I used to, terribly. But again, I think that self-censorship is resistance. Mm. And it's also, I, was just a, my, I have a friend uh, who just finished writing his first novel. And he told me that uh, he kind of spewed a lot. He had files, files, files everywhere, right? And he found that in the end, he used everything. It was, uh, some of it went into novel number two. But so the, the, I think in a way, self-censorship is an insult to the muse, to the goddess, because she's giving you something, right? There it is on the page. And who are you to say this is lousy? Because a lot of times, as, you, as I'm sure you know, Joanna, you look at something on Tuesday, you say this is terrible. Then you look at it Thursday and miraculously it's become great, you know, two days later. Mm -hmm. So that's resistance, is clouding our judgment and making us see that so I, I think self-censorship is the worst. Got to, you know, <laughs> got to get rid of that. That's an amateur habit. Yeah, no, I realize that. I'm not but... saying that to you, Joanna, or just to anybody. No, I agree. And I... One, one thing, I, I don't mean to be proselytizing or whatever, preaching or anything like this, but I think that a lot of writers, even writers who are published and successful, are not tough-minded enough. Hmm. And they by which I mean they're not professional enough in the way they manage their own emotions. 
through the course of the things. And, and I'm pro, I'm, I fall prey to this too. Mm. Uh, and I have to kind of slap myself across the face and, you know, uh, I think, you know, um, you got to be a bit of a warrior to be a writer. And in many ways, it's harder being an artist than it is being a warrior because you're all alone. Mm. You don't have a structure. You don't have a, a, a commanding officer who tells you what to do. You, I mean, think of the world that we live in, Joanna. It's right. Nobody makes us get up in the morning. Nobody pays us. Nobody pats us on the back. Nobody cracks the whip over us. Nobody shames us into doing anything, and nobody supports us. I mean, at the end of it, maybe your husband supports you or something, but I don't care how well-meaning or well-intentioned someone is, it doesn't help, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you would agree with that. Nobody says at the end of the day, you did great. You really faced that one hard part, and you really, you know, hung in there, and you got through it, you know? You made something out of nothing today, you know? Or you only had an hour, but you took that hour, and you sat down, and you did, Right. And so we have to do that for ourselves. You know? And I think it's much, much harder being a writer or an artist than anybody thinks. People think it's this idyllic life. We'll live in the country. We'll have a cottage in Dorset. You know, we'll sip tea and it'll be great, right? The sheep will be outside. It's beautiful. <laughs> Instead, it's hell. Mm. You know, you're all alone facing your inner demons, you know. And so uh, my hat's off to anybody that does it, anybody that finishes a book and publishes a book or anything like that. You know, God bless them. I salute you. <laughs> That's a good pet talk. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. And um, just, just uh, I know we've got to go soon, but just a question about um, your small press. So you've got um, Black Irish Books, and there's, uh, you have a great motto, which is get in the ring, um, which you say is aiming to inspire those who don't want to wait for permission, but want to take their destiny in their own fist, which I love. Now, um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was that... By the way, that's all from my partner, Sean Coyne, who's yes. the Black Irish in the, in the, in the family. <laughs> In the partnership, but yeah. um, uh, I, you've seen the publishing industry change so much o over the years. What, what do you, you know, what are your thoughts right now towards like indie authors, towards the changes, and 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 what you guys are doing? I guess. Well, that's a that's a really tough question, and uh, like with the Lions Gate, the book that we were talking about here, that uh, that had to be brought out by a mainstream publisher. It was too big a book. And it needed the push that a publisher could put behind it, getting it in bookstores and having a sales force and all that. But I found for like smaller books like The War of Art, that, that um, or Turning Pro, that um, they can be independently published. Um, but as you know, you have to, if you're going to do that, you sort of have to have a presence on the web. You, you know, you have to blog or do something or speak. You have to have, you have to get a following of people one way or another mm. and kind of net network around, which is not like what authors used to do. Um, but when it works, indie publishing, it works great because you get all the money. Mm. And, you know, uh, I think from the war of art, it's been like a tenfold increase. Actually, the, the, um, the, the uh, big uh, controversy right now between Amazon and Hatchet, you know, mm. Hatchet was the original publisher of The War of Art. And I would get 35 cents a copy of, you know, that's all mm. on a book that was selling for twelve ninety five in American dollars. And now, um, now I get, you know, three fifty a copy. So 10 times as much print publishing it under Black Irish. So there's a lot to be said for that, you know. You only have to sell one tenth as many books to make the same amount of money. So it I don't know if it's really the future, Joanna, because it's can everybody do that or is the world just gonna be flooded with unknown people where there are no gatekeepers anymore? But I think for certain writers of certain books, it's a godsend, you know. God bless Amazon and uh and uh, Google that, and PayPal that make all this possible. Yeah, and I, I really like, um, just to let you know, I really like your audio versions, which you do yourself and release through Black Irish, don't you, which, which is great. Do you enjoy that process of the audio? 
Yeah, and that's a, it's another thing that's so easy. It's like uh, to record audio costs like 500 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. That's all. And then you have a, the, an editor puts it together. That's all under $500. And you post it on the web and people buy it. It's unbelievable. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's a great business model and um, it's a great business model yeah and i like it's it's lovely for me to hear you because i i have i do also listen to your audiobook so it's you know it's nice to it's nice to hear the voice of the author i think ah. and and that's why i think audio is such a big thing um but anyway we, we we've got to finish so um where can people find you and your books online um, just about everywhere on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, uh, Amazon.co.uk. We uh, actually Black Irish publishes it in in England, so it's up there. And uh, I have a website, as you know, that's just my name, StephenPressfield.com. And um, yeah, it's yeah, I'm I'm, I'm there. <laughs> You are. You're, you're everywhere, and it's. it's uh, I'm everywhere. Yeah. Just like everybody else is everywhere. You're everywhere. Yeah, that's that is true. It's, it's everywhere. <laughs> well, thanks so much for your time, Steve. That was brilliant. And thank thank you, Joanna. Thank you for being so prepared and for asking such such great questions. It's a pleasure to meet you face to face over Skype.